Well, no energy technology is completely benign. So coal-fired power stations, as we know, cause climate change. They cause all sorts of health impacts. They are the worst possible option. Um, whereas wind and renewables are much more benign, but wind farms still kill birds and they still affect landscapes and people in ways that people find uh, negatively appealing. I think that nuclear is actually one of the most environmentally friendly technologies for a whole host of different reasons. It's the, really the only large-scale source of sustainable baseload power which is always available, unlike renewables which are intermittent and have to have backup, and that backup will still be predominantly from fossil fuel. And um, the other main source of baseload, of course, is hydro, and hydroelectric power means damming up river systems and it causes negative effects on ecosystems. Nuclear power doesn't do that. And even when you have a worst case type accident like at Chernobyl or a slightly less bad accident like at Fukushima, um, the, the, the consequences are serious but manageable. At Fukushima nobody has died from radiation poisoning and it's quite likely that nobody ever will. Uh, so to, to phase out an entire low carbon power sector as, as a response to a non-fatal accident doesn't seem to me to be entirely logical. Um, you also were formerly against genetic engineering, now you are very enthusiastic. What created the switch? Well, I was against genetic engineering as an environmental activist who didn't know very much about it. And what really changed my mind was the realisation that writing books about climate change science, that I shouldn't be an activist on genetics if I didn't understand the issue. And I hadn't at that point. I'd read hundreds of papers on academic papers on climate change. I hadn't read a single one on DNA or genetic engineering or any of the other aspects of that controversial technology. And so when I began to examine it more rationally, I found that potentially, and I, I don't agree with many of the ways that it's applied at the moment by, by companies for herbicide resistance, things like that, but potentially we can use it to uh, have, have much better environmental outcomes, drought tolerant crops, nutritionally enhanced crops, uh, things, you know, crop types which improve yields. And we've got to keep in mind that we don't have unlimited amounts of land, we don't have unlimited amounts of water, and we don't have unlimited amounts of fertilizer. So the more efficient that we can get crops to produce, uh, the more food we can have for a, 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 mi a minimal amount of resources. And I think if you rule out genetic engineering, you're ruling out a very powerful technology which can help us be more environmentally friendly and efficient in producing food. Can you explain the concept of planetary boundaries, what they are? Well, the idea of planetary boundaries is to try and have a a more scientific definition of sustainability, so what actually matters to the planet. Uh, this isn't my concept, it was developed by a scientific team led by Professor Johan Rockström in Sweden uh, and a real stellar cast of, of different scientists in different disciplines around the world who published a paper in Nature about planetary boundaries back in 2009. Um, and their initial proposal is that there's nine planetary boundaries, seven of them have quantified uh, limitations, so they actually put numbers to them. But the whole the, the conceptual model is is, is that that you, if you push the Earth past certain tolerant limit, tolerance limits in climate change or biodiversity or, or the water system or whatever, then you could crash into a different kind, of, you could go over a tipping point and crash into a different unsafe space. And so the idea is to put a boundary beyond where, where it's uncertain and in, in the safe zone essentially so that we can try and run the planet sustainably without going over any of these tipping points which, may not, which we may not be able to get back from. Um, how do planetary boundaries actually support capitalism? Oh, I don't think planetary boundaries conceptually support any ism or any particular type of economic or social system. The idea is that they're physically defined. Uh, so if, if you take, for example, a planetary boundary on climate change at 350 parts per million, the idea is that that's the level of CO2 in the atmosphere, which should not be exceeded if you want to keep the Earth as a you know, relatively habitable planet in terms of its temperature. So that isn't about whether you've got you know, Marxist, capitalist or any other kind of system of production. Um, but I, you know, I think within that, I'm personally an enthusiast for the market system. I think it's the best engine of, of, of growth and prosperity that humanity has ever managed to come up with, which is why we're at the stage now where, where, where the human population is getting so much more prosperous and life is better for, all, for, for, for almost everybody. Um, and I think we, we, are, we would be very ill-advised to start doing away with the market. But, you know, we've got to make the market operate within the context of the boundaries. That's, that's the proposal, essentially. But I, I, think, I think the market can do that. But we, as, as people and as governments, need to tell the market what the limit is. Uh, what kind of technology should smart, green, godlike investors be putting their money into? 
Well, I'm, I'm not sure that um, green technologies are necessarily always the best bet. You know, I've, I've lost my shirt on solar, putting money into solar cells already, um, which is probably why I'm a bit more negative than I might otherwise have been. But, um, um, you know, I, th I think the, the, the point of, of responsible and, you know, financially sustainable investment is to, is to read where things are going in the future. And, and to and to get in there early and to and to get into the, the right kinds of technologies which are going to become more important. And I don't think there's any doubt that, that sustainable technologies, that renewable power sources, hopefully nuclear and some of these other areas are going to become more and more important as governments increasingly do regulate for, for sustainable growth within the context of the planetary boundaries. Um, uh, Germany uh, changed its uh, policy against uh, nuclear power last year. Um, you think it's not sustainable. Can you explain that? I think the German switch on energy policy is perhaps the most environmentally irresponsible decision that the government has made in Europe over the last 10 years. Uh, what Germany is doing is, is closing down its largest source of zero carbon power and replacing it with a much smaller source of zero carbon power which will have the unintended consequence of increasing coal consumption and that will thereby cause more pollution, it will cause more cancers, it will spread more radioactivity from the coal ash and the smoke. Um, and I can't see any environmentally responsible reason for doing that and the fact that it's the Greens who are calling for this policy uh, s speaks volumes to me. I don't consider those kinds of Greens to be environmentalists. But what should the Germans do then? Uh, well, I mean, I, I actually think the country with the best energy system is probably Sweden, uh, which has a mixture of hydroelectricity and, and nuclear and some renewables as well. Obviously we have to connect up all of the different countries which have different power sources. Uh, the North Sea is an enormous resource of offshore wind. Uh, onshore wind is viable in, in some locations too, but to be honest, countries like Germany, Poland, uh, you know, th these are countries which don't have enormous renewable resources. You can't run them on solar power. Either you import solar power from the deserts of North Africa, which is one of the proposals, uh, or, or, or you have to essentially fall back on nuclear or fossil fuels. And I think what's going to happen with closing down nuclear is going back to fossil fuels. So that's, that's what really worries me as an environmentalist and as somebody who cares about the climate. Um, you told uh, in, this, in your speech you're an historian. Uh, what do you think mankind learned from the last hundred years about energy? Oh, um, yes, I'm a historian rather than a scientist. Um, and, you know, I think we have to try and learn some of the lessons of history. Uh, but I, I doubt that we will. Um, for me, the longer term context of history is even more interesting, actually, uh, the geological context and how short the lifespan of Homo sapiens has been. You know, we've only emerged in the last 100, 150,000 years. We've only had agriculture for eight or 9,000 years. We've only had prosperity and enormous population since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So that's, you know, 150, 200 years. Uh, you know, where we go in the next two or three decades is, is, a, is a huge open question. Uh, so I don't think we should use the past to try and predict the future, but we should certainly try and learn the lessons of it.